edition of Chargers Unleashed. Jake Hefner and Dan Wolkenstein here with you from the LA Football Network. This is your first time tuning into the show. Make sure to hit that like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Dan Wolkenstein, it was an eventful weekend for the Los Angeles Chargers. The rookie mini camps officially kicked off and are in full swing. And at the time, depending on when you're listening to this show, the veterans are now mixing up with those rookies as we speak right now. Uh, and Dan, there was a free agent signing. That was hey. Done over the hey, how about that? That we're going to delve into that should definitely add some more competition to the Chargers pass rush. But before we get into everything and break everything down, Dan Walkenstein, first and foremost, how are you, sir? How was your weekend? I am great. Weekend was great. Action packed, fun filled, uh, family filled as well. Uh, wonderful weather. How was your weekend, Mr. Suncha- Sunshine and Suntan? How you doing? Good. Recovered? Oh, recovered. Yes, ready to go. We got a big week ahead of us as it relates to football in general. The show. By the by, the way, Jake, you sound you sound very like calm, cool, collected. You're very like structured. You're ready to rock. I was, you got the vibe that you just like get me to work. Suck. Enthusiasm unknown to mankind, sure, but also very targeted. I like this new Jake Hefner this morning. I was just very relaxed. Had a very nice weekend in Cabo for my wife's cousin's wedding. It was very eventful. The scenery was great. The resort was amazing. And I'm ready to roll. Apparently, I got to go to Cabo that. more often. <laughs> Simple as well, Welcome that. back, sir. Let's get you from that calm, cool, relaxed to excited and ready to rock, which I know you are. But I just, this new, this vibe, you got this Hawaiian tropical vibe to you that I'm trying to just pull in right now. Although this- I... This from the the guy who's wearing the the garments that you're wearing right now. Fair, I just step into that one for sure. Wow, for sure. Uh, yeah, Jake, we got a lot to talk about. Bud Dupree signs a two year deal with the Chargers. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about some of the press conferences that we heard as of late, and what this means to possibly depth at both wide receiver position as well as obviously the edge position. But Jake, before that, let's talk about our friends, pay the bills. Want to remind everybody that Bet Online is your number one source for all of your summer sports this season from MLB, golf, NBA, and NHL playoff stats, all the latest news scores available for you to follow for all of your favorite teams. Get the latest odds and lines, including the latest team matchups, player props, and odds for just about every sport that is out there. Head on over to the website today or use your mobile device to get in on the action. Bet Online, use the promo code Unleashed. Tell them Chargers Unleashed sent you. That's Bet Online, where the game starts. Chargers fans got some news on Friday, right before the weekend. Bud Dupree signed a two-year deal. Veteran, played with the Steelers, Titans, Falcons, was a starter last year, has had multiple years with more than six sacks, and a depth piece added to this Chargers team that we see in the years past. Looks great on paper, asterisk, when healthy. When the asterisk falls, so does the position. Jake, Bud Dupree signs... Huge. Again, let's temper expectations. This isn't an all-pro type player, but we've talked about this for years. The depth has crippled this team, or lack thereof. Chargers now quickly turning a position or an idea of weakness into a strength, and now have quite the depth at the edge position behind Mack and Bosa. This move felt very reminiscent when the Chargers originally signed Kyle Van Hoy to bring in a veteran of that status to round out, again, a position that has lacked depth for some time now. Now, with Bud Dupree, it's very interesting from the standpoint that considering who you have in front of him as it relates to the roster and Joey Bosa, Khalil Mack, let's not forget Bud Dupree was actually starting for the Atlanta Falcons last year and put up some respectable numbers given the circumstances. Six and a half sacks, two forced fumbles for them. And now you're essentially asking someone with those type of stats and contributions to come in and be your edge four to (laughs) pair with Thule, who had a tremendous rookie season of itself. Dan, you and I were talking about this offline. We couldn't remember the last time that the Chargers felt this deep as it relates to one position, more specifically the edge. And we've talked about this on previous shows. We felt that the edge four competition was in great need of competition with what's currently transpired with Chris Rumpf. I'm, I've said repeatedly that I'm a huge fan of undrafted free agents, Traymond Morris, uh, excuse me, uh, Traymond Morris Brash. 
and I really liked what he brings in terms of the, um, you know, the at, at the edge position. I'm excited to watch him during trading camp. So this is what Joe Hortiz once again doing what he said he was going to do and finding ways to add pieces to the roster. I think as it currently stands now, the Chargers have one or two positions left before they're fully at 90 roster spots. But I thought in a low tier level, asking for a guy who had respectable stats, even as an aging veteran, this was a nice move from a depth perspective. The thing to keep in mind too, and we hear a lot of people talking about the, you know, they only have two more spots available and not that you're saying this Jake, but that doesn't mean they can't add more than two players no. to this yeah. roster. And that's probably what could and should happen. You want to add better depth. You don't want to just sit on what you have and say, all right, well, the, the roster is full, so I can't add anybody else. Like that's not what builds championship rosters, i.e. Bud Dupree. They technically had edge four with Chris Rumpf, but did they sit on it? No. And so you look at positions into your defensive line. We've talked about corner safety, just, you know, backup center. You can look at swing tackles. You can look at offensive line, tight end. There's a bunch of things they could do. That doesn't mean they only have two. I'd argue they should bring in more than two, but it's fascinating to me. And, and you kind of talked about it, especially in a Jesse Minter, Mike McDonald style defense, right? Like the versatility, athleticism, and depth of the defensive line is so important and vital to the success of the defense. We talk about how important the secondary is and how they probably need to bring in another corner. Not only is it nice to have the depth piece behind the guys in case they get injured, but to help prevent possible injuries because you can keep guys fresh. You can rotate them in. I think it was Jeremy Fowler talked about Bud Dupree was brought in to the Chargers and he may have gone to the Steelers, but he was sold on the pass rush sets between him, Joey Bosa, and Khalil Mack. Funny, they didn't mention Tuli, which I thought was hilarious, by the way. But those pass rush sets, imagine those four guys rotating within a three-man set for a pass rush, which means one guy gets a breather, maybe two, depending on how they're doing it. So preventing injury, keeping guys fresh. Remember, fast forward from the first quarter to the fourth quarter. That's important. Closing time, keep these guys ready to go. And it's nice to have a position where you're so reliant. Chargers fans are so typically reliant on, oh, can we please just keep Khalil Mack and Joey Bosa healthy? Because if not, we're screwed, doom and gloom. And then it tends to always happen. Now, not, I mean, again, we don't want it, but if something were to happen, the team is prepared for it. The drop-off isn't as astronomically large. So, the, again, it's not like Bud Dupree's this 12-sack-a-year guy right now. But for what this team needs and the depth, I thought it was a great spot. And for the price, I think it's two years up to ten million. I think I saw something. It was six around million and a half base. million dollars. Yep. Yeah, six million base up to ten million. Which again, we're talking value picks, and so this was a big one for me. I mean, a position that is very important to not just the you know McDonald or Jesse Mentor defense, but to the success of any football team. Especially in today's day, day and age where you got quarterbacks like Mahomes and whoever, edge position matters. And if you lose a great one and you have a bad one, it kind of eliminates the position entirely. Yeah, it does. And I, again, as it relates to, I, I go back to Joe Ortiz on this once again. This is just another one of those indicators that his quote from saying free agency is never done to him. Preparing is never done for him. It'll it'll be really interesting to see, depending on where the Chargers are record wise during the season, how Hort how Joe Hortiz is going to navigate this from a roster perspective. Because something that we have talked about the Chargers doing several times, if it meant adding to their team that is a piece that could really take them to the playoffs, I'd be interested to see what he's done this offseason in terms of making very savvy moves to add to the roster. Come the regular season, if there's a position of strength that Joe Ortiz can think 
needs to be strengthened again. Be very interesting to see what he can do during the regular season when it comes to that trading deadline. But so far, Dan, everything that he has said, he has stuck close to his word and it's proven in his spades. And and again, this is not some giant, you know, contract signing that the previous regime was handing out to certain players. I think this is a very low level, respectable signing that actually brings a lot of strength to a position that needed competition for it. So you got to tip your cap to the front office thus far from what they have done uh, since Joe Ortiz arrived, because he has done everything that he has said that he is going to do ever since. Yeah. And looking at the numbers real quick on this defensive line, right? Last year, Joey Bose had six and a half sacks. Khalil Mack, 17, which is still bonkers. Thule, four and a half sacks, which that was the loudest four and a half sacks <laughs> I've ever seen because his impact was so much more than it felt just two and a half sacks. And then Bud Dupree, I believe, had six and a half sacks. Is that correct? Six and a half six sacks, and a half last sacks. Year. So 17 plus 13. So that's 34 and a half sacks between the four of them last year. Them on the same team, Jake. And 17 is going to be hard to beat. But them on the same team, 34 is the number. So let's go 34 and a half. Over under. Between all of them? Yep. It's it's funny because more of this, how I see this impacting the game, is not necessarily dependent on what I've seen from those four players. It's it's going to be between from the guy who's calling the plays and Jesse Minter. Ah. And based off of what we've seen, what we've studied, what we know what he is going to deploy, that's what I rely on it more. I think that Jim Harbaugh and Jesse Minter know how important it is, especially for the Chargers who have had issues getting after the quarterback for several years. And whether that's based on health or anything else. When it matters specifically yes. getting to the quarterback. Yes. So given the fact that you now have a four-man rotation like this, and Dan, to your point, you can give a guy a breather every now and again. Yeah, I'll go over. Strangely enough, I think that this defense which we had a lot of questions marks about just over a month ago before the draft. I think what they have done has been nice. It's still not a finished project. It is still not completed by any means. There are still moves to make, but I think in terms of certain positions that you have strengthened specifically this edge group, you feel a hell of a lot better than you did a month ago. So yeah, I'll, I'll go over and more so to Jesse Minter's deployment of these four players than anything else. So then let's pull that string a little bit. I think this is probably the last edge player they sign in free agency is my guess. But you said they're not done, but the defense is looking pretty good. If I had to, and Chargers fans listening, viewing in the comments, let me know what you think. What are the biggest concerns remaining for this Chargers defense specifically? They got the edge group figured out. Linebacker groups figured out, seems. What are you most concerned about with this Chargers defense in terms of what's remaining to be solved? I mean, I know you're asking people in the chat, obviously, to answer that question, but I'll answer it. Interior defensive linemen. And as Joe Ortiz has said, you never stop looking for good corners. Between now and the end of August, I think that both of those positions will be addressed in some form, whether it's by an outside free agent that currently is not on a roster or if the Chargers are keeping their eyes open on the available cuts that are done from other teams to add to the roster. I don't think that you can look at this defense and be confident enough to say, even based off of what they did to try to strengthen it in the draft, you still feel like those positions need more depth. Yeah, I would agree. I think... Corner and safety are probably the two that I'm looking at right now. Uh, Into your defensive line, I think you're more concerned than I am, but I could see it needing to be or could be added from a depth perspective. Corner we've talked about for, for weeks now. I, I think they need a CB1 right now, one that you could rely on more than what they currently have. Not even a long-term thing. Give me a one-year, two-year max rental. Let them... You can't fix everything in one year in the draft of free agency, but you can also kind of kick the can down the road uh, responsibly and then associate that with a draft the following year. 
or free agency the following year. So CB one, if they get another, if they bring in a, if they bring in a veteran CB, I'm good with the cornerback room. Safety opposite, I'm good with their starting safeties. It's the depth that I'm concerned about, and the depth we always talk about, like you know, if one healthy, whatever. Derwin James, Lohi Gilman, let's rock. But if it's Alohi Gilman and JT Woods, not rock. That's like soft yacht rock. That's not okay. AJ Finley, not okay. And I'm, you know, I'm not trying to poo-poo these guys' potential, but in a defense that you're trying to go win a Super Bowl or take the division, you can't have your last line of defense being a guy that you have zero game film on, other than getting absolutely roasted. So you need some reliability from a depth perspective at safety. And in my opinion, starting at corner, boundary corner specifically. Otherwise, the only other concerns that I have are just the team getting acclimated to the scheme. Really? Which, how wild is that? In one offseason, the undoing and the redoing and the stitching of this team and the roster like think think about how many new guys are on this and just look at the defense we're not even talking about the offense yet how many new players are on this defense that are going to be having meaningful playing time the entire linebacking core almost the entire secondary at least the cornerback position bud dupree puna ford Dental pyramid, like it's all these guys. It's pretty miraculous how much, and I, I'm not giving, I'm not saying they don't everything, but how much they had to work with. And Joe Hortiz talked about it. Like they stepped into an, into a situation where there was a lot of stuff that had to get done. It's pretty impressive what they've done. I think when you look on either side of the ball, Dan, like the message that Jim Harbaugh gave competitors welcome, they've set, sent the proverbial shot across the bow that there's going to be competition at every single position with the roster moves that they have done via free agency or the draft. They have put that message out there. And you you have to believe that with Jim Arbaugh and his personality and how he is approaching this next phase of his coaching career and everything that he has talked about, that Again, I always go back to Trevor Sikama's quote. Whatever it is that he wants to do, it, it's good. It's going to work. It's going to work. It may not have looked like that at face value to us over these last several weeks throughout the draft. We may have been a little bit confused after the Keenan Allen trade and Mike Williams gone and everything else as far as what this team was going to look like offensively. But something just tells you that the guy behind the controls who we – Many others have felt that the one thing that the Chargers have always lacked for the better part of the last eight to 10 years was coaching. And now you essentially have brought in one of the best to ever do it at either college or the pros and in the staff behind him and let them work. And to think with the amount of tenure, Dan, they're like, this isn't, this isn't 10 or 15 years ago. Like think about everything that Harbaugh has still learned throughout his time. (laughs) <laughs> going through this. Think about how, think about if Jim Harbaugh could have met this version of himself 10 or 15 years ago, what he would have said to himself. So I love the fact that we're getting a Jim Harbaugh at this stage of his career and ready to go because he's still hungry. As he says, it's like, it's, it's two day. As he said in this press conference, I mean, <laughs> I love that again. I don't give a damn that he's quirky. I don't care that he's full of one liners. It's something that's going to catch your attention, and I'm sure it's going to catch those players' attention as well. Yeah, and you kind of let's let's get to it. So, press conference. You heard about from the receivers, Lad McConkey. You heard from Cornelius Johnson. You heard from Brendan Rice, Jim Harbaugh. Some really interesting quotes from all of them. Uh, Jim Harbaugh has the one-liners. We all know about that. Uh, wide receivers, the personality of all three of them is starting to come out, and you start to see why some of these guys were drafted and Jim Harbaugh talked about some of the grades they had on these guys. And so when they fell into their laps in round seven or round two, they pounced for good reason. Jake, what were the kind of key takeaways that you had from Jim Harbaugh and or the receivers? 
Harbaugh just talking about, you know, as good as any first day as you could have hoped for the start of rookie minicamp, um, said it was farther ahead than what he was hoping for. And, and again, we're talking very preliminary stages of training camp here. This is this past weekend. This, you know, the, at this point, the veterans hadn't even arrived yet. But you're already seeing the involvement of Jim Harbaugh with these young guys and trying to acclimate them and get them up to speed. His message was that he wanted to get them going so fast that by the time that the veterans arrive, that a majority of them would know exactly what to do because everybody essentially with the exception, you can maybe say of junior Colson is coming into a position or playbook here that is brand new to them. So it, in a way you take all that and it kind of puts it on an even keel for the majority of the team. But I love the mentality from Jim Harbaugh in terms of what he wants to do. You already saw him mixing it up with some of the quarterbacks that were How out there on the that? field. How great it was, it was that? fantastic. So just, just getting to see him and his element and, how excited he was and everything that we have heard about, uh, you know, how, how excited he was to get on the field and get this started. That was just such a great thing. Um, some of the other aspects in terms of the quotes from the receivers, you know, you've got to highlight Brenton Rice, him, him talking about his dad being upset, you know, that he fell to the seventh round and that, again, that, that chip that we felt on Brendan Rice's shoulder during the phone call when he got it when he was selected and then everything that followed after that with the Instagram post and whatnot, you could just tell that there is a lot of motivation behind Brendan Rice. And, I, and even from that accountability standpoint, he, he said that quote saying, if you don't see me out there on the field come September, that's on me. But if you do see me, you know that I put in the hard work to be here. Yeah, the the I said it earlier, the personality and some of the like the underlying the whys behind some of these receivers is pretty clear. Uh, Brendan Rice had a fantastic quote when I think it was Chris Rim from ESPN had asked him, uh, kind of like what are like his special traits or skill sets that he sees that separate him or that help him stand out. And you kind of talk about his work ethic right off the jump. And the quote that he gave to him right off the bat was every day. This is Brendan Rice. Every day I approach the game with today, I will do what others want. So tomorrow I can do what others can't. And he talks about his work ethic and how much he puts in towards his craft and the opportunity that he has in this room to provide an impact to this team. And, we're not crowning these guys. We're not sitting here saying that these are going to be, you know, all pros year one or whatever, but the mindset, the competitive spirit, right? The motivation, the, the chip on your shoulder, like Jake alluded to that, I think is what this chargers staff has tapped into and has prioritized in drafting these players. Cornelius Johnson, when he was talking about, I think it was Chris O'Leary, or chat, sorry, I think it was Chad Alexander had talked about the assistant GM that he may be the best blocking wide receiver in the class. And I don't even think Cornelius Johnson knew that, that he had said that, but Cornelius Johnson is excited to be a charger. And he talked about his days back, you know, with LT and Legadu, Nane and all of them and 21 is favorite number and all that, which I'm sure chargers fans are now like, Oh, love that kid. He's staying for sure. Uh, Lad McConkey, same thing, man. Uh, he talked about the text he got from Justin Herbert, kind of what he's looking to do with the new offense and the value that he brings. And, I, you know, how quickly this wide receiver group went from the Keenan Allen, Mike Williams era to the not Keenan Allen, Mike Williams era. And what is this to now? Again, I'd argue this receiving core top to bottom is significantly deeper than it has been for years. And while it might not have the top end talent asterisk when available, they might not want or need that. And that sounds, and it sounds weird to say that. I know people are like, how could you not want or need? Where do you divvy up and where do you prioritize your assets? And they may still prioritize the wide receiver position, but do so differently. They're not going to prioritize it with money as a resource, but this could be kind of a, you know, you always talk about running back by committee. 
this could be a wide receiver by committee and they don't want that top tier talent with a top tier $30 million price tag. And they went from the top, I think it was the top wide receiver revenue. Yes. Sure. Or salary, excuse 30th. me, to now what? They're like 30th? 30th? Yeah. It's like 12 or $13 million total, which is like a third of what it would have been to keep Keenan Allen this year if they kept him. Like, that's not bad business. It's different business for sure. But it's the new Hortiz and Harbaugh way. Several different points that you brought up there that I think are key, Dan, that we can relate to a number of different things here, specifically as it relates to the wide receivers. And yes, this is the the new way forward, essentially. And yes, there are is even from you and I and from many others, it felt like there was an adjustment period that you had to kind of go through to fully understand this because we asked Sean Merriman about this on the show last week in terms of this whole perception that the Chargers are going to be this run first team with Gus Edwards, J.K. Dobbins, now Kamani Vidal. It's just like, are you taking away the best asset that you have in Justin Herbert and his right arm? And even Merriman said, it's like, if you really think that Jim Harbaugh is not going to throw the ball downfield, he's going to get you. He's going to get you. And who would have thought that just a month ago, when night one of the draft had come and the Chargers selected Joe Alt, the Chargers had four rostered wide receivers. And now today it's May 13th and we're talking about this and we're saying the Chargers need to stop signing wide receivers because there's too many. I mean, (laughs) what, what a turnaround. And to your point, Dan, in terms of the want or need standpoint, you know, sometimes you always think about it in terms of like, oh, God, and, you know, in this league, you need to have like that number one guy that's going to be like that game changer. And and I get that. And and for and for some teams, that's absolutely true. You know what the Miami Dolphins have done. They have taken a completely different approach in terms of how they have built their offense. But the Kansas City Chiefs, after trading away Tyreek Hill, <laughs> essentially won two Super Bowls without a wide receiver one. Or two, honestly. And why is that? Because they had a running game to lean on, and they had a defense that was very, very good with one of the best in Steve Spagnuolo in terms of defensive coordinator. So they had all the different pieces to do it, and they just played a different game. And yes, obviously it helps when you have one of the best quarterbacks in the entire league in Patrick Mahomes slinging the rock. But it's not just one way to go out there and win. It's not just one design to come out there and say, we need a number one and a number two and a number five wide receiver so we can just have all these options to bomb it down the field. I feel like the Chargers have tried that already. And Dan has said this many times. That that type of, you know, that type of process has not necessarily worked from the past. So let's It has try not worked. Different. It literally has not worked. Yes. <laughs> so I'm excited to see this new approach. I am especially after everything that we have heard and talked about with the show, what we heard from Sean Merriman last week. And then you just, again, I, I, I just still laugh at it from the standpoint for, four rostered wide receivers to 11, 12. <laughs> now that we have is almost too much to count. So I, I'm excited to see the approach, but I think the message Dan is clear. Competition is being injected into this team one way or another. And who's going to be the ones that are going to come out of it victorious? You know, I, I keep going back to, I don't know, I'm going to butcher the quote, but like in short, if you don't make meaningful change, nothing meaningful will change. Like you can't expect different results if you're not going to change something drastically. And so as much as it's uncomfortable for Chargers fans and for even us at times, And as much as it might be a feeling of, oh, this is too far, or you're not doing what we think is best for the team. If they don't make change, it's not going to change. They bring in Jim Harbaugh. They bring in Joe Hortiz and the gnarly staff around both of them. They change the style of offense. They change the style of defense. And while it might be uncomfortable, a little scary, maybe a little, make you a little anxious at times. Who are we to question the pedigree of these people in charge of making these meaningful changes? It's worked for them everywhere they've been. So why are we sitting here and saying, oh, I can't believe. Just let this thing play out a bit. And I'm talking to myself and to you as well as I'm talking to the fans here. 
remember how we felt sitting there as soon as pick number five was made and the concern and questions and stuff running through your head about the wide receiver group. And then just two days later, you're feeling like, oh, okay, I get it. Cool. And then DJ Chark sides. And then, you know, it's not September yet. And there are a lot of, you know, Joe Hortiz and Jim Harbaugh talked about the free agency and cuts. And there's a lot of things that could happen between now and then. But it's fun to see the meaningful change. To see real change and not just little band-aids here and there and not try to just make little stop gaps. Like we're seeing fundamental stamps put on this team in year one. More so than I probably expected to see. We all talked about this being like a two, three year thing for them to be able to fix what they're doing and fix everything that was broken in the past. Again, like perspective. They have done so many things in what, it what, three months? It's pretty remarkable. Now, does it mean they're going to win a Super Bowl this year? I don't know. Does it put them on a trajectory to do so? Fast track? Absolutely, in my opinion. I think if there's one thing that you can say that if, if you were to, you know, outside of trying to guarantee wins and losses and final records or anything, what was it? The Chargers lost five games by what? Three points or less last year. What was it, Dan? I don't know, but it was awful. I think if there's one thing that you can guarantee that this Chargers team will be specifically from a player standpoint, is they're damn sure going to be more competitive. That I think is what I'm excited about to be in those type of situations. Again, now, again, I'm I'm not going to try to predict here final records. Mm Mm-hmm. But in terms of the competition and the proverbial message that has been sent to the team based on roster construction, coaching, player moves, draft, this roster at every position from top to bottom, with the exception of quarterback, (laughs) should be much more competitive than what we have seen years past. And honestly, the quarterback position is probably more competitive too. Just not going to be better, but more competitive in the sense that he's going to be able to win games real easily. Not have to be Superman for 60 snaps. Like it just, it's not, it's not sustainable. This roster is going to be felt this season. Like this coaching staff will be felt. This team is going to be felt game in and game out by their opponents way more than they have been in years past. And you look at the type of players, the archetypes, the physicality, the mindset, that's why. And that competition, it sounds nice. It's a nice buzzword here in in May. But that competition and physicality through training camp and all that jazz will make a difference as we start to see these games being played. And Sean Merriman talked about this in our last episode of how back in Marty Ball days, even when they were playing against some of those juggernauts, the Chiefs teams, or even with themselves, they were going to come smacking the face. Not just the first quarter, not just a couple plays, but the entire game. That's what we're going to see here. And we all heard all the stuff about like the Michigan teams, and you know they feel like they can go play another game after the fourth quarter because they've been so conditioned well by Ben Herbert and company. Is that going to be you know as much of a thing where they you know the team can now go play another game after? Probably not, but. They're damn sure going to be conditioned to where they can make it through a football game and not be gassed with their hands and their hips. I fully believe that. So exciting times, Jake, and exciting times, by the way. Special guests coming up uh, this week, as well as Chargers fans gets excited because something gets released. A little bitty thing gets released on Wednesday that we will be live for, live at five, Chargers Unleashed as the schedule for the Chargers 2024 season and every other team will be announced. We'll be live to break it all down. Jake, what are your expectations? Thoughts on the schedule release? You know, any, anybody that doesn't like football would probably look at it's like, what the hell is all this hype about for an NFL release schedule? It's like, it, it's almost like the most trivial thing to any outsider who doesn't watch football, but it's just like, this is the genius of the NFL is that they build up so much excitement about this because 
NFL season in general, any Sunday could be the difference of you making the playoffs, not making the playoffs, as opposed to any other sport that has elongated seasons. And you got to tip your hat to the social media team of every single franchise that is out there because they get to have some fun in terms of how they make these release videos. So, yes, it becomes a little bit of a spectacle. It's fun to watch all of these creative ideas come out. And ultimately, when you start going through this and trying to figure out, oh, what are the tough parts of the schedule going to be? What are the easy parts of the schedule going to be? And then make these type of record predictions. It's fun. So I always look forward to it, and especially for the Chargers social media team, who's one of the best in the business and obviously has done a great job with their anime schedules releases the last couple of years. Dan, I, I said it a week ago. Tailor this schedule release to your head coach. Make it extremely simple. If it's just Harbaugh standing there with a sledgehammer and you got 17 boxes or bricks or whatnot, and he's going to go through and just smash every single one of them to reveal who the opponent is. I even thought about this, like he smashes it and then he sends like, or he says like one of his quirky quotes and then he smashes it. Like, you know, Fat's the enemy of speed. Bang. Who's got it better than us? Not them. Bang. <laughs> it just keeps going through one by one. Like, I would love to just see a very simplistic schedule release like that because that speaks directly to who this team is going forward. Okay. A couple ideas. This could be a fun little topic here as we close out the show. What if I did a tattoo artist or something? You know how you have the Michigan tattoo? <laughs> like, have the tattoo artist kind of subscribe some funny or. Scribe some funny tattoos for each of the different weeks would be fun. Talked about this last week. Some type of like rap beef thing would be excellent. We saw what happened with you know Kendrick and with Drake and all that could be fun. Uh, it'd be hilarious if they just put like you said simple, like literally just put like one image, <laughs> just one funny image. And that's it. Because realistically, it's kind of what this is about. It's like a no frill team right now. They're not about that. They want to talk about the games. But whatever it is, we'll have it covered. I just hope some team leans into the Kendrick and Drake thing. Because that's a I, I really fun opportunity. Will. I think that you will. And with the Chargers social media team, they're very good at taking some things that are at surface level and, you know, taking the little proverbial shots here and there. So I'm, I'm very interested after what they did with the anime schedule the last two years of how they're going to try to tie that in this year. So as Dan mentioned, oh, yeah. Wednesday, when the schedule release is released at 5 p.m., we will be going live to discuss and break down all of those matchups for the Chargers for the 2024 season. So really looking forward to that. So make sure that you tune in and join the show and get in on all the crazy discussions and thought processes as it relates to the schedule release. So looking forward to that one. Yeah, Swifties beware. I got a feeling Taylor Swift's going to be on a lot of these <laughs> schedule releases for uh, Kansas City. But uh, that's going to do it for Jake, myself, Chargers Unleashed, I like the Network. This has been fun. We'll talk to you next time.